So I'm going to talk about the surgeons, maybe kind of make it more of a, um, a global talk about the more common problem, which is the metastatic disease. And when you listen to talks about metastatic disease, if you listen to five spine tumor surgeons talk about it, you're going to get kind of like five different talks, which is kind of interesting. So I think what Rod is doing here, where you have me and Claudio give a talk, it's, it's very complementary. And the fact is that the, the metastatic disease is the more common problem. All this stuff that we talked about, primary bone tumors, with secrectomies and things like that, this is rarity. This is really where the, the workhorse of, uh, of spine tumor is, and it's the, the uh, metastatic disease. Um, so let's talk about it a little bit. What I'm going to do is I'm going to show you a couple of cases, and then... Um, uh, and remember, fellows, I'm, I, I tend to call on people, so like, don't don't check your phones, and because I'm just going to call you on a case. So <laughs> make sure you pay attention, and uh, we're going to start with a few cases, okay? And I'm going to show you four or five cases. I want you to look at them, and then tell me what would you do with each case, okay? And the question that I have is, do you think all of them need surgery? Should we do radio surgery on some of them? Should we do nothing? You know, what are we going to do? About it? And if you are going to do, what are you going to do? What kind of options you're going to do. And, and, and the surgeons, when you deal with these kind of cases, these are really the four options that we have available today for patients with metastatic disease. So we talk about an intralesional resection where we're going in and we actually remove the vertebrae intralesionally. We get into the tumor itself. We have options of on-block resection, right? Uh, we talked about primary tumors. Well, guess what? Some advocate doing an on-block uh, resection on patients with metastatic disease. Um, there is an option of adjuvant therapy, radiation, chemotherapy, radiosurgery. And then the last option is minimally invasive vertebroplastic kyphoplastics. These are really the four tools that we as spine oncologists have. And you have to, whenever you look at these cases, decide which one of these four options am I going to use on, on these cases. So let's start, and just quick, uh, again, I showed this slide before. This is the on-block resection where we're going in, we remove the vertebrae in one piece. We are now experts in it. We understand why we're doing it. Um, this is the intralesional resection. This is a patient who had a vertebrectomy. You go in, you use your drill, you drill the vertebral body out, you spread the tumor all over the place, but that's okay. They have metastatic disease. It makes no difference. But you dare to restore mechanical stability. You dare to decompress the cord. Here is an anterior approach for a transthoracic vertebrectomy. You can put a cage in there, whatever it is that you need to reconstruct the vertebral body. Radio surgery, I think you've heard a lot about it in the last hour, which is definitely a, a third option. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about that. And then the vertebroplasty, kyphoplasty option uh, is a fourth option where you're going in and, uh, you know, you guys know the difference between vertebroplasty and kyphoplasty, right? So vertebroplasty, you just go directly and inject the cement into the vertebral body. The kyphoplasty option is you actually put a balloon in there, you inflate the balloon, uh, you take the balloon out, you create an empty space in there, and then you inject cement into the, uh, the empty space. Uh, you can correct some of the deformity there with a the balloon. So the first case, and, and I picked these choices very specifically, this is a 57-year-old with back pain who has multiple myeloma who has an L2 fracture and mechanical pain on a lot of pain medications. There is a fracture of the vertebral body out. And I just want you to be aware about the previous talk about radiosurgery. Radiosurgery is an option, but it doesn't fix a fracture, right? I mean, the fracture is still there. And so just keep that in mind when it comes to, you know, when we start getting crazy about radio surgery, about should it be used for everything, ultimately remember, the fracture, once it's there, radiation, radio surgery doesn't fix it. And so when you're dealing with mechanical pain where patients have a lot of movement-related pain, it's not just about taking care of the tumor, it's also about mechanical stability. So this is a patient, 57-year-old, with an L2 fracture who has a lot of mechanical pain. What would you do here? Here are your four options. Would you do a vertebrectomy? Would you do radiosurgery? Would you do on black resection? Would you do kyphoplasty, vertebroplasty? It's a multiple myeloma patient. Patient has no neurological deficit, just had back pain. So somebody says kyphoplasty. Anybody else would do anything else here? You guys are all for kyphoplasty? Why kyphoplasty, not vertebroplasty? 57. 
What's the difference? Is there any difference between kyphoplasty and vertebroplasty? You guys know any of that uh, data out there? Yeah. Go ahead. Seventy-two percent. Thirty-five percent, depending on which bias study you read. Okay. Um, but it's definitely, in my experience, it's definitely way more weak with this particular bias. Okay. So, so this gentleman here, what's your name? Castro feels that vertebroplasty has a very high rate, 74%. If, if that's the number, I wouldn't want to have a vertebroplasty. It's a very high rate of leakage into the canal. Go ahead. So you feel that the number is a little bit lower, that you can actually do it if you're careful. What do you mean by being careful? I didn't say it was clinically significant. Yeah. I just said it's Radiographic evidence. Right. Okay. Claudio, you seems like you prefer kyphoplasty. What's the reason you prefer kyphoplasty? I think there is less extravasation, and uh, when you do the kypho, you create a cavity, and uh, the balloon usually has two cc's or three cc's, and that's a less, the three, three cc's that you inject will have less resistance to spread. You know, the cement tends to go where there is less resistance. And uh, I think the MD Anderson series a few years ago demonstrated that there was no symptomatic uh, uh, you know, there was extravasation, but all of them asymptomatic with kyphoplasties, and we had a few uh, symptomatic extravasations with vertebroplasties that had to be, uh, you know, patient had to, be, to go for the compression. Okay, we'll, we'll talk about those points in a little bit. Here's the second case. Kidney renal carcinoma, 52-year-old, already had a nephrectomy, has an L1 lesion with pathologic fracture, has no neurological deficits. The reason why I picked up this case it's exactly like the multiple myeloma, same location of fracture, same presentation, but different tumor. What would you do here? Would you do intralesional, on block, chemo, radiosurgery, or vertebroplasty? Anybody? So, no neurological deficits. This is a renal med. So I'm going to leave it open here for a little bit because I don't get anybody to raise their hands right now. You would do a vertebrectomy? Yes, right. Okay, anybody else would do anything else here? No. No. So as a little bit of a disease at the level below, above, you see the little end plate fracture there? But that was, uh, was read as osteoporotic fracture, but no radiation. What would you do here? Here are your four options. So... You see why it gets a little tricky? Because it's the same location tumor, same type of fracture, neurologically intact, just mechanical back pain. But now you're hesitating a little bit because it's not multiple myeloma, it's renal cell carcinoma. Does that, should that make a difference when it comes to what you're going to do? Here is the third case. Now, you guys are experts. Chondrosarcoma, right? Primary bone tumor, kind of in the lumbar spine also at L4, Right? On a patient who has mechanical back pain, what would you do here? Here are your four options. What would you do here? Okay, that's the third case. Fourth case, a 68-year-old gentleman with thymic carcinoma, already received radiation, not documenting progressive disease at T11, T12. You can see the lesion at T11 and T12. You can see the prior era where the patient's been radiated but now has new big meds at T11 and T12. He has some back pain, all right? Same type of patient, same presentation, back pain, neurologically intact, kind of thoracolumbar region. Would you do anything different here? Here are your four options. What would you do here? Here is a patient with breast cancer, 63-year-old, already received radiation, now coming back with a lot of pain, thoracic pain, and here's the MRI. There's a little bit of fracture in the front. There's some tumor start extending into the canal, compressing the spinal cord. Already received radiation, thoracic spine, no neurological deficits. Most of these patients coming in and they have a lot of pain. 
Or do you receive chemo, receive radiation? What are you going to do here? Here are your options again. So the question that I have for you all is, are all these cases need surgery? And does the difference in the tumor type makes a difference? Because if you think about it, these are all fractures in the thoracolumbar spines. I'm not making it too complicated. They're not coming in with uh, weakness and bone bladder incontinence. They're just coming in with pain. What are you going to do here? And what would approach would you do? Should it be a similar approach? Or should you change your, your management based on the fact that these are different tumors? So let's talk a little bit about metastatic cancers. And then we'll go back into those four mm -hmm. cases or five. I'll show you what I did. So it's a huge problem, 1.2 million new cases of cancer a year. It's about half a million deaths a year. It's a major cause of death. It's complication due to the metastatic disease. And this, the bone itself is the third most common site of metastasis after the lung and liver. So we are busy, right? We get a lot of these calls about patients who have lesions in the spine. The spinal column is a very common place for it to be. All right, it's not just in the femur and in the acetabulum and all these areas. It goes to the spine. 90% of these patients with cancer will have spinal mass at autopsy, and up to 30% present with symptoms. The majority of the symptoms is pain. And when it comes to where you're going to find it, most of them are in the thoracic spine, uh, and most of it is the actual, the anterior vertebral body. And so we talked about the primary spine tumors. I'm not going to spend too much on it, but that's just for the sake of completeness. At OSU, 95% of the cases I see is metastasis. Okay, 5% are primary tumors. And when it comes to what kind of surgeries we do, most of them are done posterior. There's a lot of different approaches to deal with it through a transpedicular approach. We do anterior, we do combine both front and back. Now I'm going to let Dr. Patchell deal with all the, the advantages, disadvantages of surgery, radiation, surgery and radiation. When you put it all together, and I'm going to skip all that because I know he's going to go through it, I'm just going to put his slide here. Mm -hmm. Ultimately, the bottom line shows that you know, decompression, surgical resection, uh, followed by possibly radiation, really is the way to go. We used to think the, that radiation is the way to just treat all these patients. They're going to die anyway. And you got the world expert here with Dr. Patchell to really go over what he found, which is really revolutionary when it comes to what it is that we us as surgeons are now really, he gave us the tools and the, the rights to say, hey, we should actually do surgery here and only radiation may not work as well. And his conclusion ultimately was that surgery and radiation therapy is superior alone to radiation therapy. And he'll explain to you all that. So now that we know that surgery and radiation is really is the way to work on a lot of these patients, you as surgeons have to be very comfortable with all approaches to the spine, whether it's from the back, from the front, from the side, um, that is, you, you really need to be very comfortable about all of these approaches. You got to have very good anatomy knowledge. You got to know the instrumentation. You got to be very comfortable with all forms of instrumentation. You got to have support from your oncology team. And again, it's, this is a multidisciplinary surgical expertise uh, in, in many ways. All right. The critical issues is the patient is stable. Uh, a lot of these patients are very sick. Uh, and you really want to make sure that if you end up doing these cases, that there is a reasonable predicted survival, that there's actually benefit for you to do the surgery. If this patient is not going to be here three months from now, surgery may not be the way to go. So you got to get an input from your oncology colleagues as to whether there is a reasonable uh, life expectancy after you do your surgery to justify doing the surgery. So now that you go to the routes of maybe doing surgery because everything else fits, the medical oncologists feel that it's reasonable, when are you going to do these surgeries? What are the criteria to do surgeries on patients with their metastatic disease? These are, for me, the four things that I'm looking at. On every patient who comes in through the emergency room, through clinic, through consults, to say, should I do surgery or not do surgery? And that's a tough thing to decide. And I can tell you right now, it's much harder not to do the surgery than it is to do the surgery on these type of patients. I'm going to repeat it again. It's much harder to say I'm not going to do it than to say I'm going to do it. You have somebody with a bad cold compression who's weak in their legs, and you know what you can do. You can do the vertebrectomy, you can do the decompression, but should you do it? 
and to make a decision that you're not going to do it because of X, Y, and Z, medical morbidities, who knows what, is much harder. So does the patient have indication for surgery? One, do they have a neurological compromise? Two, do they have pain? I want to stress the fact that pain is an indication for surgery. The thought that the patient doesn't have a neurological deficit and they only have pain so they don't need surgery is not true. Patients with pain, that's one of the indications for surgery, especially mechanical pain. Three, do they have instability and deformity? Claudia have talked about the instability score. That's a huge component of whether we should do surgery or not. And then four, is surgery going to impact prognosis? Some cases, you may extend the patient's life expectancy by doing your surgery. So if you can alter the prognosis, make him live longer, which sounds weird in metastatic disease, surgery may be indica indicated. So neurological compromise, you all know about all this. Cold compression, myelopathy, root compression, radiculopathy. Those are the things that tends to take us toward doing surgery if the patient fits all those criteria. If you see somebody like this with a renal mat, the cord is squashed. You can see spinal cord, right? Where is the spinal cord here? It's that little, it's this thing here, right? All of this is tumor. That is the spinal cord. Patient comes in, very weak in their legs. You, you don't really have a lot of options here. You know that you need to take this patient to surgery. If there's a reasonable patient has good chance of getting out of it and there's a reasonable life expectancy after that. Pain is also a criteria to do surgery. And it's very important to make sure that this is mechanical type pain, right? Pain that gets worse when you get up, walk, goes away when you lie down. It tells you that there's a fracture there. When you lie down, the pain goes away. When you stand up, when you walk, the pain gets worse. That's the kind of pain that you can help with surgery. You're gonna stabilize it. And when you stabilize it, that mechanical pain component will get better. Versus biologic pain, which is tumor-related pain. The tumor is in the bone. It just causes pain. Whether you're lying down, you're standing up, doesn't matter what you do. The pain is there all the time. You're not going to help this, this, this patient with surgery. There's no mechanical pain component there. So I, oh, when I get a resident call me in the middle of the night and say, oh, this patient has a lot of pain, is it mechanical? Do they have the pain when they lie down? Yeah, the pain is just as bad when they lie down as they stand up. Ah, I'm now thinking, take a step back. Maybe it's a biologic pain. Because when there is tumor in the bone, it causes pain. I want to hear the pain gets worse when they get up. It gets worse when they, when they sit. And it literally goes away when they lie down. That tells me a fracture that gets loaded when they stand up, something that I may be able to fix. So that's the kind of patient we're talking about. That patient will have mechanical pain. They get up. They are excruciating pain. They lie down. The pain gets better. That is also an unstable spine. If you look at the criteria that we talked about, it's going to be unstable. And so these are the kind of patient you can help with surgery for this. So spinal instability, we talked about that. Claudio explained it very nicely this morning. That's a, the that's a third criteria for surgery. If we think that the spine is unstable, uh, then it may be reasonable to go ahead and do something. Here's a patient who had tumor in the spine. I can't remember what it was. The surgeon went in and there was a fracture in the front, did a two-level uh, laminectomy from the back, but with no instrumentation, put a small cage from around the spinal cord, that cage piston into the vertebral body above and below, ended up going and doing a, a, a thoracotomy, T10, T11 vertebrectomy, put a bigger cage, that cage piston into the vertebral body above and below, and then went into the canal, and ultimately ended up to get a huge reconstruction from the front and the back. Again, sometimes the instability is not just by the tumor, it's by the triple W, right? The wrong surgery by the wrong on the wrong patient by the wrong surgeon. So these are things that you want to think about. And then the fourth reason to do surgery is you can actually change the patient's uh, life expectancy with tumors. And I think Roy will talk a little bit about it. It's sometimes by doing these surgeries, the cancer is going to do its thing. But if the patient keep walking, the bowel bladder still continent, they won't die from the pressure sores. They won't die from the pneumonias and the urinary tract infection. They're independent. They're walking. By default, they tend to live longer. They don't die from those complications of being paralyzed and being in bed. So when it comes to alter prognosis, you know, one of the things that we think about is the, the pancreas tumors, 
uh, which are very good patients that we may end up operating on them, you can actually alter the patient prognosis. They will live longer. Mm -hmm. Solitary Mets are also patients that you can alter their prognosis. Some advocating doing an unblocked resection on a single renal met uh, or a single melanoma because of fear of contamination. So that's something that's controversial, but we can think about it a little bit. The superior sulcus tumors are excellent examples of patients where we can alter the prognosis on these patients. These are also big surgeries. A lot of these, you do it with a combination of the lobectomy and resection of the tumor. And the reason why it's good to do these kind of complete resections of tumors, because if you leave positive margins, tumors come back. If you have negative margins, patient lives for a long time. So the critical issue really here that I'm trying to stress is just like we stressed in the primary tumors, is that you got to know what type of tumor it is because every tumor will dictate, different tumors will dictate you what to do. Ultimately, it tells you it's the same slide that they use in my primary tumors. It will tell you everything as to the extent of the systemic disease, extent of previous treatment, and predicted survival. This is a slide that U.S. fellows take always and make sure you remember it and imprint it into your brain because there are a lot of patients that don't need surgery. Remember the first case I showed with the lymphoma? Lymphoma is a medical entity, doesn't need surgery, okay? These are patients that do very well with adjuvant options. The small cell lung cancer, some of them, the thing about my, the, the residents who come and talk to me, say, oh, I got this patient, he needs surgery. Well, he has a lung cancer. What kind of lung cancer? Because small cell lung cancer mm -hmm. is a medical entity disease. It's, more the, it's not a non-small lung cancer. These patients, are, these tumors are very radiosensitive can respond well to chemotherapy. And so these are patients that you may not need to operate on. And so the lymphoma, the myeloma, the small cell lung cancer, these are patients that are very sensitive for adjuvant therapy. Rarely would you need to do anything. I just saw a case before I came here on a patient with massive cord compression, neurologically intact, small cell lung cancer. Went ahead and radiated. A day later, half of it went away. I mean, it's just remarkable without any intervention from surgery. Again, go back to the biopsy is crucial to make sure you know what it is. Sensitive tumors, the breast, the prostate, the thyroid, and then the non-sensitive tumors, the colon, the renal cancer, the melanomas, the sarcomas. These are the patients that commonly we get called on. When it comes to cord compression, just make sure that you identify whether it's tumor compression versus bone compression. Okay, this is a patient with a big bony fragment in the canal. And if you have a patient who has a lot of bone in the canal because of a fracture, Chemo radiation will not make a lot of difference there. Some of these patients, you're going to have to go in there and take that bone fragment out. So I always tend to make sure that in addition to the MRI, I also get a CAT scan to make sure whether the compression is from a tumor or whether the compression is from a bone fragment in the canal. I put that slides before, again, for sake of completeness, just to remember that for primary bone tumor, as I mentioned earlier, that adjuvant therapy has, a, has that option also for these particular bone tumors, and we talked about that. So metastatic tumors, the goal is palliation, unlike in primary bone tumor where the goal is curative or long-term prognosis. Adjuvant therapies may be available, and resection is generally intralesional. These are three very important points and very different as compared to our primary bone tumor talk. When you get somebody like this who have multiple mets, you know, where are you going with this, right? These are the difficult cases where you may not do anything versus primary tumors where the goal is the cure, adjuvant therapy is limited, and resection, if you can, is an on block resection. So I want to go back to uh, the four, five cases that we showed earlier. You guys were already all over it. When it comes to our third case, the patient with a multiple myeloma with the L1 fracture, we looked at the four case choices. I ended up doing a vertebroplasty there. I think it's a very reasonable option to do. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit about, uh, you know, so the tiboplasty, my, my prejudice about it is, and, and I'm open to criticism and discussion a little bit about it, I used to do a lot of kyphoplasties. I don't do them anymore. Um, one is because um, a lot of the vertebroplasty cases, especially with multiple myelomas, there are numerous fractures. So there's maybe two or three or four vertebral body fractures, and I found out that the, and papers have showed it, that the outcome is the same, whether you do a vertebroplasty or kyphoplasty. Um, 
we don't really have the cement extravasation. So the advantage of kyphoplasty is that it's a low pressure injection because you're creating an empty, an empty space. You may be able to get some correction with the balloon and uh, the likelihood of cement uh, migration into the canal seems to be smaller. I have operated on patient who had kyphoplasty and what I find out after somebody did a kyphoplasty on a renal mat, and I got to go back in and fix it or take the material body out, is I find a blob of cement in there. I can just take my number four pin field and just kind of roll it over. It just kind of sit a big ball of golf ball sitting there. Um, I like the vertebroplasty because it interdigitates with the bones. It becomes one with the entire vertebrae. I don't have a big chunk of uh, cement. Again, this is my own personal observation. I, I'm, I'm okay with kyphoplasty, but it's just kind of, I like the interdigitation component of the vertebroplasty. I inject the vertebroplasty when it's very, very thick, a toothpaste type thickness, maybe even more. I uh, can inject three or four vertebral bodies within 20 minutes. The exposure to radiation with kyphoplasty is significant. It takes longer. The kyphoplasty require most of the time bipedicular uh, placements of needles. With vertebroplasty, it's one needle goes from one side, it fills up the entire vertebral body. You can use a curved needle if you want. And you actually get a lot of correction of the deformity just by positioning the bed on the table. A lot of the correction is not really from the balloon or it's just that when you put them on, the, on prone position, the spine just kind of correcting itself a little bit. And so when you inject the cement, it just stays there. So you actually get about two millimeter correction in kyphosis with vertebroplasty. Um, so these are kind of like the reasons where I pretty much converted exclusively to do vertebroplasties. I don't do kyphoplasties anymore. But it is definitely an option if you want to spend the time with the balloons and put the needles on both sides and all that kind of stuff, then that is fine. It just that for, so a single level I can see it, but when you get into three, four levels, that's a lot of balloons and a lot of radiation exposure, both to you and for the patient. And I just find out, and a lot of my patients are very sick anyway. Um, when I do three or four levels, I do it under general anesthesia. I don't do it under MAC or anything like that. So I want to go in, get out quickly. Kyphoplasty takes, in my hand, takes a while. It's not as quick because it has to be two needles, inflating the balloons, taking the balloons out, and so on and so forth. Um, the issue with the cement migration into the canal, again, I, I agree with one of the comments there. If you put him, it's very thick and you watch it. I just don't have that experience. Um, but it is a higher pressure injection. You are injecting it into bone, though with multiple myeloma, it's soft. The needle goes in, it's like butter. Um, and then there is also a role for radiofrequency ablation that we start doing on some of these patients. Uh, that's just the entire process is much quicker, and the outcome is the same. So that's kind of like my philosophy about these multiple mile, uh, about these vertebroplasty uh, versus kyphoplasty uh, um, treatment. Uh, again, I've done them both, and literally, if we have to, the amount of the amount of uh, cement augmentation cases that's needed in my hospital, I would need a service dedicated just for that. There's just so many patients who are sick, who have fractures, who are in pains, who need it. And so we actually have two days dedicated just to do vertebroplasties. That's how many patients are done. And so we, we, we do hundreds of them. And knock on wood, so far, we do not have any issues with uh, cement migration. I am very particular about making sure that that cement is thick and it's thick if I think it's thick, it's going to be thicker. And so when we put it in, it just we just don't have, have not have any issues with cement uh, uh, migration. Though I can show you many slides of my dedicated vertebroplasty talk where there's, you know, I get patients who are coming in with cement in the canal from vertebroplasties. So clearly there is a role to be concerned about it. And there is probably a higher, safer margin for patients with kyphoplasty because ultimately you do inject it into... Uh, empty space, you don't inject it into bone. The other thing with the kyphoplasty is sometimes my patients already have a bone in the canal a little bit or tumor behind the bone in the canal. And when I inject cement, when I inflate the balloon, I literally see that bone fragment get pushed backward even further into the canal. So that makes me a little bit more anxious when I have cases where there is a little bit of a relative contraindication to do a vertebroplasty 
because there is bone in the canal or a fracture leading into the back of the canal. And when you inflate the balloon, things are moving. They're not staying the way they are. Where, where are you displacing the tumor into the canal? Do you displacing the bone further into the canal? So in that sense, with vertebroplasty, I know the way it is. It's the way it's going to stay. I just need to be very careful with the cement when I inject it in. But clearly, this is just my own opinion. I have nothing to prove for it. But that's kind of like my, uh, and we can talk about it once I'm done, because I'm almost done. Uh, and then renal cell carcinoma. So I agree with the thought here as to preoperative embolization. That's exactly what I did. Renal cell carcinomas are very, that's before and after, pre and post. There are a lot of tricks about dealing with uh, intraoperative embolization. Um, and we, you know, we should have another talk for how to deal with the bleeding during cases with tumors. And then, uh, you know, a cage was placed in there. This is what it looks like. The chondrosarcoma, we talked about that with the radiation, with the uh, unblocker section. Uh, the case with the thymic carcinoma, it was a very good case for radiosurgery. Again, there was no fracture. There was tumors that were growing. It was pain. So I, to I totally agree with Dr. Uh, Adler about radiosurgery. And to talk to uh, what Rod brought the other, the other time about patients with su supplementation of cement. This is the last case, uh, the lady with the breast cancer. You can see already got the radiation, already got the chemotherapy, now has caught compression, has a couple of fractures from the front, there's already some kyphosis. And so here's what I did here, where I did an intraoperative vertebroplasty, uh, multiple level, put all the needles in after the laminectomy, once the needles are in there, you can inject cement and then quickly put, so as, you know, just simultaneously go on one after the other, inject the cement, pull the needle out, screw the, the screws right into the cement very quickly before you, um, before the cement get hardened. I'll just show that there's some, some options of uh, cannulated screws and hopefully that will be something that we can use here. These kind of screws will be fantastic because then we don't need to mess around with the anxiety aspect of doing it quickly before the cement goes hard to inject, pull, put the screw in, and it has to be done on both sides simultaneously. And then, um, and so that's kind of like the way it looked. So in conclusion, the management of spineoplasm is challenging. It can restore protechnological function. It can improve pain and can have a significant impact on the quality of patient's life. And the key for all this talk is, again, understanding the tumor biology of spine tumor because it is critical in defining your goal of treatment in a given patient and determining the, ultimately the, the therapeutic approach, the appropriate therapeutic approach. So thank you.